that was honestly this dude really goes in depth and I appreciate how he actually cared to find out about who I was and what I was about before I got here. You're the man, dude. You really are. Keep it up. Thank you, Paul. Really, I've done a whole lot of interviews in this past two years, man. A whole lot. And I would say this was my favorite. Thanks. And I really don't give a fuck to like make blow some. I don't know. I know. This is, was awesome, dude. Truly, it was. This is a Blaring Out with Eric Blair show today with former Big Brother cast member and singer-songwriter architect of the band Van Alden, Paul Abrahamian. How you doing today, Paul? I'm doing fantastic, buddy. How are you? I'm great. We're going to talk about your music, talk about Big Brother, get into your life story. What was your youth like growing up in Tarzana, California? Well, asking the real questions. Man, I loved, I loved growing up in the valley, in the San Fernando Valley. I think it's one of the coolest places to grow up as well. I think OC has like a similar vibe, but like you get a lot of that old school buildings and old school kind of people and the cars and you got that real like California wave. So growing up in Tarzana was great, man. And that's honestly what inspired my name for my band, Van Alden. So it's the street that I grew up on, but I split it into two and kind of did some other thing with it. But I had a lot of, a lot of memories and a lot of fun on Van Alden Avenue and within biking or going up into like the caves at the top of the hills and stuff. Just a lot of good childhood memories. So were there any parental precepts that you rebelled against? Yeah, literally everything. Really? <laughs> everything that I am now. I grew up in a very uh, conservative Christian Armenian family. So um, if you look at a family portrait or if you look at <laughs> kind of like even meet my parents, you'd be like, how did you guys pump out this one? Like, where did this guy come out of? It was a strict, no tattoos, no piercings, go to either law school or be a doctor or <laughs> you blew it, you know what I mean? So definitely a lot of rebelling in my youth. I was in a post, I was in a hardcore band from the age of like 13 to like 19 and screaming away in my, <laughs> in my parents' house, you know what I mean? So uh, a, lot of, a lot of things that I had to kind of, an upward battle for sure. Was the Christianity that your parents displayed for you, do you believe it was real or what did you, was, did you rebel against it because it, you felt it was phony? Um, I didn't, I didn't more so rebel against the Christianity in and of itself, but I was always like a more open thinker or more kind of just like free spirited when I was a kid and you know, not tattooing my body didn't make sense if I was intrinsically a good person you know what i mean there were certain things that i was like yeah maybe it says it's bad but like is it that bad like does that really matter because i don't cheat i don't steal i don't kill people i do good i like to be good and i think that matters more you know what i mean and if there's an omnipotent being that's looking over me i think he's going to care about the important things and not the silly tattooing on my body or or getting piercings or listening to heavy metal it was it wasn't so much rebelling against the religion but just like the cultural, I guess, conservative ideas of, I guess, where my parents grew up. You know, my dad came from Lebanon in <laughs> the early 1900s. He grew up in a village on a farm, dude. You know what I mean? And he made it out to America. He was the first person from his family to make it out here, hustled, learned the language, made, made a dream for himself. And same with my mom. She grew up in Armenia. Like, Armenia, early 1900s, totally different than here. So when they both moved here and pumped me out, <laughs> they had completely different non-Western ideologies and kind of like family boundaries. But fortunately for me, I went to public high school. So I got to like mingle and, and kind of see the other cultures around and kids around. But a lot of the kids that, you know, Armenian kids that I maybe grew up knowing or went to school with didn't get that same opportunity. And they're like, we're on kind of two different playing fields or understandings of American culture or American lifestyle. What were the highlights of your time performing, moshing, and hanging out at the Cobalt Cafe in, Ma, Cano in, in, Camo in Canoga <laughs> Park, California? And this is a club, apparently, that Avenged Sevenfold came out of and yeah. Linkin Park came out of. That was the prime of my youth, man. That kept me... That kept kept my sanity every day after school me and my buddies would just go to the cobalt cafe whether it was a band we knew a band we didn't know a touring band that was there a few months back that we made friends with man like it was a portal for the youth and there were good things there were there were shitty things about it there were awesome things about it but it it sculpted my youth man it was a place that i can get away and mosh to a hardcore band i've never heard before or play a show for a bunch of kids that I went to high school with and kind of started hustling at a young age, man. I'm, look, I'm playing tours now 
and I'm talking like about bands that can possibly open. And I'm like, whatever. If the band thinks they could flip 20 tickets, like toss them on the bill. Mm -hmm. And some of these promoters in like middle America are just like, what does that mean? What are you talking about? I'm like, wait a minute, you guys don't hustle out there? Like if I wanted to play with any of these bigger acts or touring bands, I had to sell like 45 tickets myself to even fucking play, dude. Yeah. It taught me how to hustle in the music scene and it, it showed me the tough and ugly and real side of what kind of getting people to shows or what the music scene is about that I think not a lot of people get to experience. I got like the raw, unedited like version in that little valley venue, you know? It, it's a relic, it's awesome. What kind of dreams did you entertain during your time in your punk band, Reviver, prior to 2013? So with Reviver, I mean, we were just trying to get on any, any post-hardcore label, whether it was like Epitaph. I knew um, our vocalist was interning at like Sumerian Records and they were talking about like, signing a couple of our albums and then I had to go to university and that's pretty much where that line got crossed when I had to go to university my parents were like yeah you're not <laughs> you're not gonna be in a, in a hardcore band you're gonna go to school and I was like shit guess I'm going to school you know uh which I don't regret I studied philosophy at Pepperdine and it kind of molded me to who I am now but it's funny how things end up right back where they need to be and I'm on a path to make music my career and it didn't take all the opportunities that I went through for me to realize that, you know, I can actually do that. If I really want it, if I really want to accomplish goals or dreams, as long as I put my mind to it and be persistent and consistent and believe in myself, there's no reason why it shouldn't happen. Pepperdine University, that's near Malibu. Yeah. So that's cool. Even more California vibes. You're just California vibes my whole life. Between the Valley and Malibu and all that, it, it's been awesome. Being a philosophy major, what do you think your philosophy is now? How would you define it? I think that all of us are part of something bigger. I think that people need to stop looking at life through like an individual lens and realize that we're all kind of part of something greater than us, whether it is God, whether it's uh, something just far beyond, something between planets we don't understand. I don't know what it is, but we're here for some reason and it's not worth stressing about it, worrying about it, thinking about it, trying to figure it out because nobody's really figured it out, you know? Uh, my main thing is to be good, do good, make yourself happy. And I think happiness stems from loving yourself. A lot of people tell you not to be selfish. A lot of people tell you not to worry about yourself. But a main thing that I believe is that if you don't, if you're not honest with yourself, if you're not true with yourself, if you don't love who you are, your main kind of pod, you know, your being, the, the person you look at the mirror every day, if you don't love that, then I don't really know how you can love a foreign human, you know, or somebody else. If you can't deal with what's here, how are you gonna project that onto others? So um, love yourself is one of the step ones I say with life. Love yourself and then love life itself. And if you follow those things, I think, good things will happen to you. What was your motivation in pursuing music? A lot of things. Um, how it makes me feel, um, how music personally makes me feel, how certain artists have inspired me or have gotten me through tough times or good times or bad times. I think music is a universal language and um, I think I have a message to share with people and it wasn't until me kind of going on TV and seeing that I had people who you know, believed in the things that I believe or who actually benefited from things that I say. You know, I've poured through tons of fan mail or messages of kids who have come up to me about self-motivation or whatnot. And seeing all of that kind of reinstilled the confidence that I think maybe I never had to pursue this for real, you know? And maybe it was a little bit of my parents telling me, hey, when are you gonna straighten up and go to school? And kind of dimming that dream and to a point where me just growing up and realizing, hey man, like, your life is what you make it. It's not what people say it's gonna be, it's not what your parents think it's gonna be, it's what you really want it to be. And if this is what you want, maybe buckle down and do it, you know? And I've, I've learned a lot along the way and I think I, I have music to thank for that. Oh. These are fucking great questions, not thank the typical you. bullshit that I hear like, oh, uh, how did you feel after the second time you lost? Like, you're like, hey, how was the Cobalt Cafe? And I'm like, my man, like you're asking the shit that I'm actually passionate about yeah. or like where it comes from, for real. So like, how did Big Brother come about? So I was in my senior year at Pep, like Pepperdine University. I had just come back. I was living in London for a year. I started my streetwear brand, Dead Skull Apparel. It's like a lifestyle tattoo slash biker culture. Um, 
And I was kind of just floating around, you know, I was graduating. Oh, that's exciting. Had a little small business. That's exciting. And then I got an email from CBS and I thought it was fake. I was about to dump it right in the trash because I'm like, what is this, you know? But I scrolled down and I saw the stamp and like a number and it was like legit, more information than most spams had. So I was like, let me just call them. Turned out to be real, showed up for like a kind of in-person interview. And then one thing led to the next thing, led to the next thing. And then I was... On the, on the show. How much of your big brother public persona was the real Paul and how much of it was fabricated through the editing process? I really can't tell you that because I haven't watched back my seasons yet and I don't know, it, some people either choose not to believe me or think I'm dumb for not watching my seasons but like, again, back to my philosophy on life, I did it, I lived it, I know what happened, there's no extra information I need, you know, I'm savvy, I've, talk, I've spoken to people, I've heard fans. I don't need to sit there and watch it. Maybe when I'm 75 and bored, I'll like roll up a joint and start watching me in my 20s, you know? But right now I have other stuff to do. I got other stories to make and other adventures to go on that I can relive later on when my, maybe my legs aren't working or I'm just old and bored. Like I don't need to sit back and just fucking watch what I just did. Yeah. Like I did it, I just did it. <laughs> what, I got other stuff to do. I'm not just gonna be like, oh wow, let's check this out, no. So do you think that Big Brother fans really know who Paul Abrahamian is, heart and soul? Um, some do. I think some who have really followed me on my you know, journey, who take the extra step to pay attention to my art or my, my, my little posts, my story posts, like to kind of dive into what I'm really into and about. I think those people know who I am. They see what I talk about. They see what I'm passionate about. And then you have the people who just don't like me because whatever, they didn't like the way I was on a TV show or they didn't like that I beat the people they were rooting for or whatever reasons they have not to like me. They, they saw it on a television show, you know, and on the television show, I was just an exaggerated version of myself. You know, there's no situations on that show that would correlate to my life. I'm never going to compete with friends and run through slime to try to spell a word to win money, you know what I mean? So I tried to make it as wild as I could. I saw it as an opportunity for me to have a platform. I was there for entertainment, so I did my best at trying to entertain people. And from the feedback that I get, I think I did an okay job at entertaining people. Not only that, you kind of, I mean, I always felt watching you, man, this guy is like unstoppable. Like he's, he's set such a high standard. Well, I mean, it probably has a lot to do with your parents, the way they raised you. And cause there is a mental capacity that we get from our parents. Totally. And you know what I'm saying? If they're intellectuals. My parents are super intellectual. I think it's more so that they know who I am, how I was born. They saw little tendencies of mine as a kid and they, they kind of molded me being super observant of my personality, of my traits, and kind of fueled me or put me in directions and things that I would be good at, you know, succeed in. And I learned my savviness from my dad. Like ever since I was a kid, he would take me to the Long Beach swap meet or the Valencia swap meet or, and just five, six a.m. I'd be crusting my eyes as a little kid and watching him do like business deals or hustling or like, I saw the hustle at a young age and I played chess at a young age. So, like since I was in first grade. So when I walked into Big Brother, I was like, oh, this is just a chess game, but with people. Cool, I know how to talk to people. I know what, like, I'm very honest with myself and my feelings, and I don't like to differentiate myself from other people. I think we're all the same. We eat the same, we shit the same, dude, we feel the same. That's why I disagree with a lot of the homelessness in, in, in America. I disagree with how this country takes care of its people and the homeless people in this place. And, and even how normal people treat homeless people, I think it's, I think it's wrong, man. I talk to them as much as I can, as much as obviously they seem mentally, you know, stable and fit. I don't know, I just like people and I like to relate with people. So in Big Brother, I would just be like, what would I want Paul to say to me in this moment? I'm gonna say it and it would work because you just put yourself in someone else's shoes for a minute and you could see from a different lens. How did season 18 of Big Brother differ from season 19 for you mentally and emotionally? So Big Brother 18 was absolutely difficult. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't really watch the show until like since I was a kid, I would watch the comps and go, oh, these are cool. These are fun. I would want to do this. But I didn't like sit there and observe gameplay. So on my first time around, I was just running through the woods barefoot, eyes closed, <laughs> no clue. And 
I remember like the first couple of weeks, I thought me, Jose, and Victor were just, we had the game in the bag, dude. We were the alpha male. We're like, oh, we're going to blah, blah, blah. And then first week, Jose, one of the guys in my group kicked out. Second week, Victor, the other guy kicked out. I was like, all right, there's a pattern here. I think I'm going to be next. So it was that moment where I was like, all right, I see what's going on here. I see what's happening. And I started kind of swimming upstream. The second time around, I got the, I got the shtick. I got it. I understood what the concept of the game was. So it's kind of easier the second time around, both stressful-wise, strategy-wise. Um, yeah, and people are going to say, well, yeah, you played the game. Obviously, it was easier. But, like, yeah, <laughs> they asked me to come back, so I did it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it, it was easier, but at the same time, it was also difficult because I was against 15 people who should have wanted to get me out. But they didn't because <laughs> I'm either that good or they're not that good. When you became a Big Brother season 19 house guest, how did the immediate affection of cast members Elena Davies and Christmas affect your self-esteem? Um, so I was never in a showmance uh, on the show. I don't believe in showmances because I think it's really, really a, a, <laughs> a logical decision to start dating somebody in a controlled environment where they're maybe not being 100% themselves mm -hmm. because I don't know, they're on a <laughs> TV show. Yeah. So I never really believed in that, even though like these people were cool, these people were beautiful, these people were awesome, but we weren't in the real life. We were kind of in a different situation. So sure, I could admire these girls for their certain characteristics or the way they were, but my mind, my, my goal was to win a game. If they were great and they were awesome, we would have those same opportunities like three months later, you know? And if it's something that needs to happen now and it can't wait for three months, then it ain't worth happening in my book. So I would avoid the, the emotional relationship kind of being vulnerable to those feelings on TV. I think it's kind of weird. Also, my grandma's watching, dude. I'm not gonna like plow. <laughs> on television, you know? I'd go home and get hit with a slipper, dude. Can't do it. Do you think the cult of personality helped you on season 19 because you already had hand by being a star? It definitely helped, obviously, because these people knew that. But here's the thing, like, I can't relate and I don't understand because I would have never done what that cast did. I played season 18 when there was four returning players. And I had no clue what any of their games were like. And the first little meeting we had, I was like, yeah, so we got to get those guys out first, right? Because that's just kind of common knowledge. Like, they have played this before. They immediately have a leg up. So maybe we should just communitively focus on these guys first. So the fact that that didn't happen at all in season 19... I really, I don't get it. I don't get it. Even if I loved, if I was X player and I loved Paul from season 18, it wouldn't stop me from saying, yo, that dude lost by one vote. Maybe he shouldn't be here at all, you know? But, and then people always try to throw on the, oh, you had three weeks of safety in the beginning. Okay, there was like 12 other weeks in the game, dude, or like eight other weeks in the game where as soon as that ended, no matter who it was, should have been like, all right, well, that guy's available now. Should we just get rid of him now, you know? So whenever fans or, or, or interviewers hit me with this question, I really don't get it because I cannot f put myself in that situation. And I'm here preaching like, oh, put yourself in people's shoes. I was in those shoes. Mm -hmm. And that was not my thought processes at all. No matter how much I liked, like let's say Nicole from season 18 in the beginning, I was like, yeah, dude, let's get this girl out right now, you know? But nobody did that for me, or I guess maybe one person did, but then I got them out. So sorry about it, you know? And I feel like a lot of times these fans put their aggravations on me for mm. having, they were like, you had everybody just do what you say. You ruined Big Brother. And I'm like, isn't that the point, though? I'm supposed to get all these people to do what I say so I can get to the end and win, which is kind of what I did, but I didn't win because a few people were upset, and I tried. I still got to the end, you know?
but they had free will. So and, and that can go both ways. Like people could say, well, Paul, you had free will and you were kind of brutal to these house guests or you were very cutthroat. And it's like, yeah, because I had to be like if I wasn't brutal, cutthroat, 10 steps ahead, causing chaos, they kick me out. And sure, that might be entertaining for you, but it would suck for me because I'm trying to win half a million dollars. So. There's that, that battle of where I, I don't even argue with people. Oh, you sucked because everybody just did what you said. I'm like, thanks for the compliment. Don't know if that means I sucked, but sure. <laughs> In the same breath, though, I'll see these fans say, oh, this season's so boring. Nobody's really playing or nobody's really doing anything aggressive. And I'm like, but you said you didn't like the aggressiveness. You said, it, you know, it's, it, it just boils down to regular society. You can't please everybody, so just... Be your best, do your best, and keep trucking forward. Would you say that Big Brother is a show about house guests conspiring against each other to win money? Yeah. <laughs> Literally, yes. Okay. That is exactly what this game is. All right. And I don't really see any other um, angle, aside from it being a social experiment, sure, but the social experiment in and of itself is a bunch of people conspiring mm -hmm. against each other for money. I don't know what else it's for. What are you there for other than money? You signed up to win a prize, right? So if you're gonna put yourself through three months of torment just to be an Instagram model, I feel like there's easier ways to be an Instagram model <laughs> than go on a show with like brutal um, mental or physical warfare. Some of these comps are hard as hell, dude. Yeah. It's very hard, even the mental warfare. Like even if you're in a season where everybody is happy and nice to each other, that seclusion from society Abrupt seclusion is sudden. It's hard. Not many people can do that. You know, your brain chemistry changes. You don't get the same stimulation. You don't get the same, you know, chemicals kind of releasing your brain. Dopamine, not dopamine. Not everybody can handle that. You know what I mean? People crying. Grown men that, crying yeah. on the show. Now, is do you think that's real? Is this how messed up it is in there? Yeah, bro. Yeah, it is. It, 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 and here's the thing. Like, I cried once my first season because I saw my parents. Like, I saw a video of my parents and my animals. And I love my parents and I love my animals. And I was in a stressful situation and I didn't have my support system. So when I saw them, it was emotional. But I have never cried for something I think that a house guest did to me or did toward me on a show. Like, again, I'm different. People have different feelings, but there's nothing really a stranger, a person that I just met can say to me or do to me that's gonna make me cry or make me be that vulnerable or upset. Like, I have different like guards put up in my I guess personality that just don't allow me to be upset by certain behavior from certain people, you know? Yeah, if you're my mom and you say something to me, it's probably gonna hurt. But if you're just some fucking, some dude I met on a show who's whatever, like, <laughs> okay. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't upset me as much. So that was another thing I had to face. Some of these house guests were claiming they were really upset by the things that I did, which sure they might've been, um, but I, I don't know, dude, like you signed up to be on a show where you know that you're going to be lied to and manipulated and kind of co competition. I was competing, you know, we're competing for something. I don't know when you compete for something. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like one V one, you know, this is how I compete. It's cutthroat. Well, I mean, you're, you're, you're in an ant farm, essentially. Right. So, so you're there for a purpose. You have to carry out this purpose. It's not like being in the world where you can have mercy. And again, yeah. I, di I didn't lose sight of that purpose, whereas some maybe went on a show mass. Some maybe got like some sort of validation elsewhere in that house. And that's what the, 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 half the trick is, is are you going to get fooled by distractions, by the hot girl that was casted to be your perfect type of girl? Because they do that. You know, you're doing these personality tests, they're gonna find, what kind of girl do you like? They're finding that exact one and putting it in front of you to yeah. throw you off. And the sooner you just keep your eye on the prize, I'm here for a reason, signed up to win a game, I'm playing a game, I didn't come here to find a girlfriend, I didn't come here to make friends, I didn't come here to be an Instagram model, came here to win a game. So when you keep your focus on one thing, you do that one thing, you know, but when you, start to deviate from the path a little bit and get caught up in these draw. That's when you're, you lose the game. That's when the game, you lose sight of what you're there for. 
how did the big brother money change your life? It gave me knowledge. And that's a weird thing to say, but it's also not. Uh, I feel like people act different when they've never had X amount of money. For example, immediately before Big Brother, I had never had 50K plus dollars in my bank account, right? So that was a, sh oh, whoa, you know, what is this? I realized that I, it didn't change much, you know? I didn't just walk out and buy a bunch of stupid stuff. I did buy myself a uh, 69 Nova SS. I had to gift myself a little, mm. a little baby, you know, a little classic American California hot rod. Aside from that, man, I realized, wow, okay, money doesn't really, it's, it's, it's cool, it, it adds comfort, it gives you a little bit of free space, but it doesn't, it doesn't define me, it didn't change me. I didn't start buying a bunch of new different clothes. Bought the same clothes. My pair of Vans, some shorts maybe from H&M, and like a cool band tee, a vintage, a vintage Harley tee, I don't know. It didn't change who I became, it didn't change what I was doing, the activities I partook in, like still went moshing, still got a GA ticket and got punched in the head, even if I had $50,000 in my bank account. So I learned a valuable lesson there that, hey, money isn't everything. Money doesn't, doesn't define your happiness because you were getting punched in the head in that mosh pit before you had 50K. Now you got 50K and you're equally as happy. So fortunately for me, and I guess maybe the way that my brain is programmed, it didn't change much. It just gave me clarity and it made me not have these weird misunderstandings about money. Or it, it alleviated me from doing things for money. It gave me more of an opportunity to create art for the purpose of creating art. Not creating art because I think it's gonna sell or because I think this t-shirt design will do well or I gotta create a new product. It was more so, hey, I'm gonna make stuff because I can, you know? So that's the, the little difference, but it also taught me a valuable lesson about just not letting money change who you are. And, and it did because I was, I got back on one another 50K and made money with my clothing company. And I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, so I, mm -hmm. I turned my opportunities into fruitful, you know, kind of situations. And again, it's a blessing, but it didn't change who I was and didn't change the way I thought about life. Didn't make things sweeter. It made them more convenient. It made them, sure, a little less stressful, but uh, money ain't it, man. Money ain't it. There's a sweetness in life that you can find absolutely broke, you know? And I learned that lesson as a, when I lived in, I lived abroad for a year. I was in Prague, which is one of my favorite cities in the world. I had a beer that I paid one euro for, and I just sat there and I looked at a sunset and self-reflected and told myself that this was the happiest, one of the most fulfilling, happiest moments that I've had in a while. And that cost me no money. That moment, sure, getting there or whatever, yeah, it cost me no but like that moment in, in and of itself intrinsically, I had a, a one euro beer and a free sunset and I was content inside. So there's a lesson that I learned with that and then getting that sum of money all at once just validated that thought process. The money doesn't last forever. But it's, it's also not stupidity, man. And, and sometimes I feel bad for these folks because it's just an influx of this new thing that you've had such a misconception about. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, again, like society tries to mold us. Society, you need money, you gotta do money. Everything is money, 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 money. America, everything is money. Everything is money. So when you're brought up being told that, go to different European countries. You know, they take breaks, they take vacations because not everything is about money. Sometimes things are for happiness or healthiness or just to take a load off. But I feel here we're always on this construct of I need money I got to make money I got to do money and who made money we did we made up money and then we're complaining about money so these human creations these man-made objects that control our life control our thought process control the way we do things or why we do things they get in the way man they get in the way and I know it's like all right hippie you're sitting here talking about you don't need money what happens what I'm not saying that. I'm not saying don't work. I'm not saying don't make a living for yourself. I'm not saying don't put in the input that then gives you the sources to live life. But don't let money get in between family members, friends, things you do. Don't, don't let money be a discouragement to your happiness. You know, don't let it have so much control over you. The minute I stopped thinking about money is when I started making more money. And the, the point I'm trying to make there is I stopped doing things for money. I started doing things for myself and for my happiness. And in and of that happening, 
the money started to come because I was honest, because I was true. I found the things that I wanted to do. I found the things that I like to do, but I didn't settle for a job because it was paying me more or I didn't do something because I'm going to make a lot of money doing it. I started to do things because I wanted to do them, not because I had to do them or not because I wanted to make money doing them, if that makes sense. And that shift in dynamic in your subconscious, in your brain, which you can tell me is as hippie as you want, but your brain is pretty powerful. It lets you do everything that you do. So what makes you think that by not reinstilling certain ideologies or philosophies or subconscious ideas that you won't project them in your real life? I believe it. It works for me. Well, do you think Van Alden is a band or a project? See, we've been having talks about this for, for a long time, and we don't know what the hell it is, and we don't really care what it is, because Van Alden is a really weird situation. I've got two, mu two producers, engineers, songwriter, DJ, my cousin J Code. He is part of, the, part of the project. He's a trap DJ. The kid gets flown out, Coachella, Alta Festival, this rave, that rave, and he's just getting these people to headbang and go nuts and go to a different world. Super cool, super insane, but he comes back and plays keys and synths and pianos for Van Alden, right? Then we have my buddy Isaiah, who is another producer, engineer, songwriter. If he's not playing with pop artists like AJ from the Backstreet Boys or Skylar Stecker or BB Rexa, I don't know, he's all over the place doing that. He's over here making this dark pop, emo kind of indie rock music for Van Alden. And then there's me. I collect oddities, I collect human skulls, I own a clothing company, <laughs> I travel a lot, I'm all over the place, but I, I tie down and I'm here for Van Alden. So I don't know if it is what people want to make it. We don't really define it as anything. We're just a group of dudes who want to make some noise that we enjoy making. And how was it born? My cousin Joey and I, again, another funny thing is all three of us grew up in the hardcore scene. One of them ended up playing with the back, people like the Backstreet Boys or pop stars, you know? Back when I was 15, or, or even all of us were 15, we would never imagine we'd end up playing pop music with like someone from a Backstreet Boy. Or Joey ending up being a trap DJ. He played hardcore music, he played hardcore play music, I played hardcore music. And it's funny how we all ended up back, you know, creating a different style of music together, but with those roots that we gained from living here in the valley or live growing up here in LA with that true punk scene, you know? So it started with... Me coming off a of Big Brother, um, getting that confidence, getting that, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest with myself and I'm really gonna try this time. I'm not gonna let ideologies or my parents or my crazy subconscious doubt me. I'm gonna fully believe in myself because I know this is what I want and I'm committing. And from that moment, Joey and I, we started producing music, uh, created some songs, did some covers, found a sound and wrote an EP with which Zaya kind of came in the mix. I met him at AJ's 40th birthday party, you know, got schlepped along and it's been a little over a year now. We have two EPs out. We're about to hit our second tour. Everything is produced, mixed, mastered, done, all in-house. All our social media, all our tours, our video content, our photo content, our music, we literally do, <laughs> we do it all. So. It's fun, man. It's hard. It's tough. But I think it's I think we're creating like a wave of people who are genuinely using our music to escape. And I think that's what we wanted to do all along. I looked at some of your influences when I first heard some of your music. I thought it really takes me back to like the 1980s Brian Ferry albums. Ooh. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. If you listen to like Boys and Girls or yeah. any of that stuff from then on, okay. you've got that vibe going on there. Hell and I yeah. think that's a deeper vibe than some of the, no no offense or no, anything, no. but some of the other people that you, you know, Bon Iver and stuff like that. I think, let's go back to the real roots. It's very Brian Ferry-ish. Yeah. And he's the king. He's the master. Absolutely the master. And that's cool that you pointed it out. And I really, I'll take that compliment. You know, that sultry, that low and slow, like, I love it, dude. Yeah, and I you think, got it. and it feels good. And I think we're in a time where people just want to bask in that for a little bit. We're in a really messed up time, man. We are, and I yeah. wouldn't be surprised if this gets labeled the second Great Depression because America doesn't seem very happy. You know, we're split. We hate one another. We point fingers. We don't want to listen to each other. We just want to combat it with hatred. And I don't think that's what America's about, man. I really don't. 
We're a country that claims to be free and liberal and open-hearted, open-minded, open arms, powerful, successful, but you look inside and you know, the homelessness and the way we treat each other, the way we talk to each other, just the social climate is kind of scary, man. It's kind of it's kind of a weird time. So I don't know if people can maybe escape or kind of reflect or or whatever it is with the music that I create or maybe it can even just get them through then I've done my job. I don't watch any media. I don't pay attention to media. I don't let them tell me what I should be doing or what I should be afraid of or what I should be thinking. Like what scares me most is I think free thought is diminishing diminishing in this mm -hmm. society. You cannot be a free thinker anymore because if you stand alone or you have some thought that isn't maybe with the herd or with the majority, which you're allowed to have thought and you should speak your mind, you know, obviously if you're not being ignorant or, or just flat out crazy, people are, I think, are being bullied out of free thought, which mm -hmm. is scary to me. Why do they want free thinkers? They don't want people to be enlightened. They don't want people to, to see the bigger picture, picture, see that this is all just a show that's distracting you from the real kind of beauty of the world and the beauty of life. But instead, they'd rather have you pick a side and hate one another or pay money or, or instill fear so you could fund some other thing that's going to cause some other reaction that's going to fuel some other form of payment. Like when you just zoom out and kind of see the bigger picture, I think you I think it'll maybe people will start to understand and stop being so mad at each other and be mad at the people who are telling us to be mad at each other. How would you say your 2018 self-titled Van Alden EP differs from the 2019 Van Alden EP, You're Not Who You Used To Be? My man, so um, totally differs just because the first EP, we were very experimental. We were very like, we don't know quite exactly what we want to sound like, but we, 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 want, we know we want to make this kind of sound. If that makes sense. So the first EP was all over the place. We were sampling old French disco, getting a part, manipulating it, turning it into a different song, chord structure, boom, chopping it up. Like we were just sampling weird stuff, getting analog synths, making crazy noises, kind of structuring it into maybe a little bit of a rock song. To be honest, most of those songs started off with me and my acoustic guitar. And then analog synth, sampling, we match chords, change chords, turned into all electronic, indie rock, a weird other world. So. From that, we kind of gauged what songs we ended up liking, right? Because when you're writing the songs, making the songs, you end up hating them anyway. But after you reflect and you're like, oh, I like that sound. I liked how I, this sounded. Or people seem to gravitate more towards this. Okay, cool. And you're not who you used to be is a step forward in the direction that I think we need to end up. There's this big mold and the first EP kind of filled up a little bit. Second EP filled up more. And I think with the third body of work or with these next kind of this next phase of Van Alden, I think we will be into our form of like what, what we said. We're gonna be delivering things like, this is what we sound like, this is who we are, this is what we're hitting, you know? And it's all part of the journey of discovering who we are, what we are. Tell me about the title. What does it mean to you? So You're Not Who You Used To Be is awesome. I was like drunk in New Orleans and I pretty much tagged that on a wall somewhere. It was like a big thing and I was there for Mardi Gras and having a good time and having all these experiences that I'd never had before or debunking all these ideas I had in my head that you know weren't really true. And it's like, damn, I'm not even the same person I used to be. Like all these ideologies and concepts that are new to me like are completely breaking the mold of character that I once was. And it's not a bad thing because it's progressing forward, but it's a different thing. So when I hear people say, you're not who you used to be, I've heard people say that maybe to each other or maybe to me and Upon further reflection, I realized that, you know what? That's not a bad thing. If anything, I think it's a good thing. If you are who you used to be, that means you haven't done any growing or changing or developing or, or really gone through anything in life to mold that another one way or another, right? So part of it comes with you understanding that, hey, you should be changing. You don't wanna plateau as a person because that's, that's when people die, mm -hmm. when you plateau. That's mm -hmm. when the brain dies or the creativity dies, when you're just flatline, you know? Mm -hmm. You wanna be changing, you wanna be growing, you wanna challenge yourself, you wanna fail, you wanna succeed, whatever it is, you are changing who you are and you're becoming a bigger, a greater, a, a different version of you, which is not necessarily bad, right? But we also get stuck into expecting 
that other people are going to stay the same, that other people are going to continue being the same. And it happens in relationships, in friendships. Shit, I lost so many friends in this past three years, I'm 26. I didn't think I'd lose so many friends in my 20s. Nobody geared me up for that in life. Nobody told me that the guy I'd be hanging out with in high school and I right now, we, you know, we, we just don't see eye to eye and we kind of slowly just, it's like, damn, where'd that guy go? You know, did I expect him to be that same guy from high school? You know, or, or is it okay that he changed to, to go somewhere else, to be someone else, to develop in another way? And maybe if life wants it to happen, we'll meet again and we'll be two different people. But I don't think that's a bad thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So part of this whole analogy or philosophy of this concept and album is you're not who you used to be and you shouldn't expect others to be as well. You should continue to grow and you should allow others to grow as well. Allow others to change, allow others to make mistakes, forgive, forget, move on. What inspired the lyrics to the songs off your new EP, You're Not Who You Used To Be? We're gonna start off with the song Foolish. So Foolish is kind of a story between two people. Um, I kind of left it ambiguous. Yes, it, it pertains to a certain private moment in my life, but the ambiguity of the song pretty much correlates to like, hey, you, we've all been in a situation where you wanna do something, you know it's probably not a good idea, but that little fire inside of you is, is still, you're still like lying to yourself and kind of doing it even though you're like, oh, I shouldn't, oh, this is bad, but you still end up doing it. So Foolish is kind of that song of that battle you have inside of, I can't, should I, am I going to, you still do, you let yourself down, you don't let yourself down. That inner kind of struggle when it comes to decisions that you know may not be the best choice. You kind of want to do them anyway. It's kind of the basis of that song. Stay. Stay kind of correlates with multiple relationships I've had in my life with, I'd say a woman, you know, women with girlfriends. And a lot of times I have communication problems, you know. I will be a hard ass about things. I think, you know, if you don't like it, well, you can just leave, right? Because that's simple logic. If you don't like being with someone, you shouldn't string each other along. Just, you know, cut it off. But I realized with growing up, with relationships, with understanding people's feelings, that it's not as simple as just cutting people out and maybe the things that you say in moments of being upset are not quite what you mean. You know, speaking from emotion or coming from a place of hurt is gonna make you say and do things that you regret or don't mean. So stay has a lot to do with self-reflection of realizing that, owning up to human error and human emotion and understanding that maybe attacking situations more clear-headed and logically is better than with hyper emotions. Forever. Oh, forever. Same thing, relationships in my life where people you know, they, the, the first lyrics, don't fall for me so you won't fall for me because I can't be who you want me to be. So don't you fall, don't, don't fall for me again. That concept has followed me a lot in relationships in life where people have constantly tried to change me, whether it's, you know, parents, friends, this, that, you know, we're in a culture where people influence one another and I was never one to be influenced. I did the things I wanted to do because I wanted to do them. I believed in them. I thought they were right. I trust my own judgment. I am a free thinker. I, I believe in myself. I believe in the things that I believe. So forever comes for, don't try to change me. Don't fall for me because it might not be what you want. XO. XO is one of those things where, not really regret, but you end up in a rut or you end up in a situation that you're not very fond of. You kind, it's a very spacey song. It's a very in your head song, kind of in a daze. And that's, I mean, how I felt when I wrote the song. The song was written on a one, one off. Like we had a kind of a little beat that we just made. And I didn't even record the vocals in a booth. They were out being recorded on like a playback audio. So it was kind of just how I was feeling that week. I was kind of just in the clouds in my head, being lied to, being told certain things, not followed through. And it was just an, express, an expression of being on the receiving end of a bunch of human emotion and error. It takes a lot to realize that everybody's imperfect, imperfections, being aware of imperfections. And this is something I recently learned with my family, man. I always thought my parents knew everything. My mom and dad were like God to me, dude. They're God, they're gods. They feed you, they clothe you, they provide for you. They're God, dude. Whatever they say is right. You're gonna believe your parents. That's why a lot of people end up fucked up because their parents weren't right, you know? Mm -hmm. So I've reached this weird level of adulthood where some of the things that my parents say to me or suggest, I truly disagree with. And I'm like, yo, I disagree with it so much and I care about you so much that like, I need to help you understand that that's not right. But it was so tough to swallow the pill that, hey, your parents are human, imperfect, and trying their best. If you're a parent and you're watching this, love your kids, 
take the extra time to explain things to your kids. They're your responsibility. You brought them here and they're a product of your upbringing. So take the little extra time to give them a fair shot at life and to give them a solid understanding of what life is about. What was so important about you doing a cover of Seven Nation Army by the White Stripes? Man, Jack White is uh, my, one of my idols, right? An absolute rock star. And I remember when I first picked up my guitar, man, and I was first, I rebelled against the violin, dude. My parents had me with some hard, hard ass Russian like violin teacher would like slam my little eight year old fingers on the fretboard and just gnarly. I was like, all right, dude, violin's for nerds, leave me alone. <laughs> Somebody get me a guitar and get me out of here, you know? Started playing electric guitar when I was like nine, 10 years old. And from that point on, man, garage bands were it. Fellow kids who knew, other, who could crappily play like the drums or the bass just as crappy as my guitar. And Seven Nation Army, baby, never failed me. Bum, 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 bum. I was rocking that, we were jamming that all day long. Simple kick, drum, yeah. snare, like, and I, it was like my childhood, dude. That, that song brings back such nostalgia, such like innocent, pure moments of music and youth, you know, youth, life, carefree, like no, your, your biggest problem was your amp not turning on or a string breaking. Like, what do I do now? Got to get my mom to take me to Guitar Center. What? It has a lot of like nostalgic value. And I was like, man, I got to give that thing some more life here as an adult because it's, it's followed me my whole life. I jammed in bands. I sang in a punk band for a while. When, once you realize I can do this, I can write songs. It, 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 dude, it's like you have this hope. The minute you, you eliminate fear from your mind, you realize that nothing is, is really impossible or incapable. Obviously, if you're logically like, yeah, if you're missing a leg, don't, you, you're not gonna be the fastest runner, sure, or maybe you will with a bionic leg, I don't know, but if you're honest with yourself about things and you really believe in yourself and, and, and aren't delusional about certain concepts and ideas, I'm fully, I fully believe you could accomplish whatever you want. What is your ultimate vision for Van Alden and where would you like to see yourself in five years? I have no idea, man. My ultimate vision is that I can continue creating music and inspiring people and getting to meet people who are like-minded. People who come to my shows, like you can ask any fan who has ever interacted with me, I'm, I'm here to talk to you. You're here to support me. I'm gonna tell you I love you. Like you're awesome, you know? Like you're dedicating the time or the energy that you have on this planet and you're giving that to me because you respect what I do. I, I, gotta, I gotta sit here and chat you up. I gotta sit here and know who you are and, and, and feed off of that, you know? So I wanna continue to do that. I wanna continue to meet cool people, inspire cool people, and make music forever. And if, if the cards are in my favor and I get to do that with the financial income that society has heavily slapped on top of our heads, uh, I think that would be a real blessing, man. What do you look for in a woman? honesty and confidence and a passion for something doesn't don't care what it is it could be life it could be fashion it could be music you need to be passionate about something there has to be some spark inside you that is pulling you in one way you have to be connected with something that is just hey come here just like music is to me i gotta have somebody who understands that that unfillable hole that you're forever searching to fill with a passion how do you know who your real friends are? Friends who, who, who don't hold any expectations of me. Friends who I can not talk to for three months and instead of being upset with me will embrace me and say, damn, dude, where have you been? Fill me in on all the stories. Friends who understand that it's not about them in our friendship. It's about our friendship. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about our friendship. So let's, let's keep that bond. You know, if I'm gone, if I'm out doing things in the world, I want a friend who's going to be also doing things in the world where once we do come back together, we can share these stories, we can grow together. And I like friends who are honest, who are mean. Most of my friends, if you see me interact with them, you'd be like, how, how have you guys not punched each other in the mouth yet? Because we're brutally honest. We tell each other the things we need to hear, not the things we wanna hear. And sometimes it leads us to a point where we're, we're upset, but we're only upset because we know it's true, right? I don't like friends who just stroke me or pat me on the back or say, Good job, or well, that's great. I like friends who are honest with me. I don't care what that means. Honesty could be that it's the most brutal, mean thing. If it's what I need to hear, that means you really care about me. But if you're just telling me what I want to hear, 
that means you, ca you, you don't care about me at all. You just care about some weird ulterior situation, right? Ulterior motive, or whatever. I don't like people who hold expectations and I don't like people who aren't honest. If I, if I do something for you, if I get you something, I don't, I don't really do the whole holiday thing. I don't find it necessary for me to go buy you a, a crappy gift just because Christmas is around now and I gotta go to Macy's and buy you some overpriced dumb cologne. No, I'm gonna buy you stuff throughout the year because I, you're my friend and I like you. If I go somewhere, find something you like, I'm gonna buy it and give it to you. No occasion needs to tell me that. It comes from here. So I like friends who do things with their heart and not things with expectations. Okay, so we're now we're gonna talk about Dead Skull Apparel. Do you consider yourself to be wise? Um, I don't know if wise would be cocky, but I, I like to think that I'm an observant individual and I'm self-reflective, maybe not self-reflective. Some people be like, hey, you're an asshole. Sure, but I'm reflective. I, can, I observe and I take a lot of notes and I think a lot. I think about things, I think about situations, I think about moments, so I'm a thinker. I'm an analyzer, sure. Okay, so I need to ask you, as far as your Dead Skull apparel line goes, you need to tell me what the wisdom is in some of these the phrases. So let's start off with live fast. What is the wisdom behind that? I have that tattooed right here too, this live fast. So that's kind of followed me ever since I was a young teenager. I remember I got my first like single speed bike, you know, just one gear, no brakes, absolute chaos, you know what I mean? And that's when I kind of, I just had, I, I, I painted on that bike, I wrote live fast, cause it was, I had no brakes. It wasn't, if something got hard or tough, yeah, this probably isn't the wisest thing. You guys are like, oh, smart guy, he rode a bike with no brakes. Had strap locks, you had to skid stop, you know? So I inherently learned something there that, you know, life is kind of like that. And sometimes you can't just hit the brakes because you'll go flying. If you're going too fast and you slam on those brakes, that bike and you are doing, uh, four somersaults forward. Sometimes you gotta maneuver, sometimes you gotta do a quick, you have to pivot, you have to adjust in life. So that philosophy has followed me all the way through and only in my adulthood it changed to live fast, never die. So live fast means run through life, run. Don't look back, always run forward, keep running until you hit the end of life. Don't slow down for anybody, don't get down on yourself, do the things you wanna do, do the things you can do and just go for it. Never die. Obviously not literally, but more so conceptually. And I believe that if you live fast and you do a bunch, you make the most of your time, because time is important. Mm -hmm. If you make the most of your time here on earth, you will never die. Because whatever memories or the bold statement or the inspiration or the good that you left behind will continue long after you're gone. I idolize people who can create something that's there after they're dead. Uh, be it Hugh Hefner, Playboy, Tiffany & Co. I don't know, these, these brands, these concepts, these ideas, these musicians, right? Mm -hmm. People who can create something that lives past them but continues to inspire or create or do on this earth. That's kind of like the formula that I think has to happen to achieve that. Born to lose, born to cruise. What is the wisdom in that saying? <laughs> born to lose, born to cruise. So for that one, it was kind of like, look, sometimes you just get a crappy hand. Sometimes life is gonna deal you the bad hand. Bad things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people. Sometimes the world just works in a funny way. Look, it is what it is. No use crying over spilt ma milk. So if you're born to lose, cruise, man, make the best of it. Whatever situation you have, whatever life or this experiment experience kind of gives you make the best of it dude you're here you're, you're you're experiencing it you're alive you're conscious you're aware make the best of it don't complain don't waste your time complaining don't waste your time fighting the inevitable right if if there's something maybe you're born with an ailment i don't know you, you're down on yourself about it it's inevitable it's unchangeable it is what it is persevere past it cruise Enjoy what you can with what you have because you're here to enjoy. You're not here to be miserable. What a dumb thing. Imagine being consciously aware and choosing a miserable path instead of choosing to just be happy about things. It's all perception, man. Again, back to what do I look for in a friend. I hate bullshit conversations. You're wasting my time. Mm -hmm. this, this superficial, oh, stroking each other's egos or stroking each other's, oh, what did you do yesterday? I, who cares, dude? 
I don't care. You know, I don't, nobody cares. You, we're just talking to talk and waste yeah. each other's time. And I'm not here for it. Some people call me a dick because of that. But I think it's the utmost respect when you don't waste people's time. When you value time and you don't waste others' time, that's when you're being the most respectful. So I'm sorry. I'm not going to sit here and have a Joe Schmo random bullshit argue, uh, conversation with you. But if you want to sit down and talk about important stuff and further thought and maybe come to conclusions together where we will benefit, I'll talk to you all damn day long, dude. On your Instagram, there's a photo of you holding a sign that says, I am a descendant of an Armenian genocide survivor. How has this influenced your worldview? Thank you for asking that, man. It's influenced it a lot. It, it's taught me a lesson of perseverance. So my great-grandfather, so those who don't know about the Armenian Genocide, so the years of like 1910 to 1915, right before World War II, pretty much, the, the fuel to World War II, there was a genocide that was committed in Armenia where the Ottoman Turkish Empire pretty much raped, pillaged, and murdered 1.5 million Armenians, primarily for re maybe religious reasons, for power, for land, whatever, whatever it was. Uh, Armenia was the first Christian nation. Um, the Ottoman Turkish Empire was an Islamic state. There was a power, I don't know, uh, uh, aggression. There was Soviet stuff happening. Armenia was part of the Soviet Union. People were branching off. There were different like cultures and countries branching off and becoming independent from Soviet Russia. Turkey didn't like that. Their neighbor would become an independent country, kind of feared that. So this, they decided to just commit mass killings because back then, I guess it was easy to do that. Uh, <clears throat> my great grandfather was a survivor of this. He pretty much watched both of his parents killed in front of him. Um, him and his brother had to escape and they did business in Turkey. So they spoke the language, they, they knew the language and they pretty much had to battle the two soldiers that ruined their family, killed them, took their uniforms, faked being Turkish soldiers and escaped out of Armenia. Um, had to go through like lakes, had to hide in lakes for multiple days at a time. My uncle, or, or not my great grandfather's brother got like gangrene in one of his legs, had to like get one of his like feet amputated. It was gnarly, gnarly stuff. So had my great grandfather not survived or had it in that fight of survival and you know, my grandma told me stories of growing, like what the scene was like. It was like neighbor's heads, soccer balls, dude, Tur like t Ottoman Turkish soldiers. It was brutal murders. It wasn't just like war crimes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, oh, we were battling. There was no battle. They, they marched a lot of women out into the middle of the desert, women and children, and just marched them until they died from dehydration. They raped a lot of women and children like it was it was gnarly there's documentation there's papers there's history there's journals there's all this stuff and turkey still denies that these happen these killings happen they don't they don't acknowledge the armenian genocide for what it was they just brush it off as war crimes or it, it, it exaggerated numbers and it's frustrating because it's been over a hundred years of denial of mass murders and <clears throat> when hitler you know, was going forward with the Holocaust. In his main speech, he said, after all, who remembers those of the Armenian Genocide? So he, Hitler was influenced by the killings of the Armenian Genocide. And imagine a hundred years later, those who committed those crimes deny that it happened. Do you see how this is scary? Do you see how an act like that, which fueled something like the Holocaust, is now being denied? And my people were done. Armenia, there's more Armenians living outside of Armenia than in Armenia because we were chased out of our land, had to disperse to other countries, to America, to, to all over Europe. You know, we went all over the place to, to continue to live. Everywhere we went, we have Armenian churches all over the world because we took our religion with us. That's what we kind of like, we grounded ourselves with, with the, with the church. If we open up a church, it's gonna attract Armenians. So we, we had places in Turkey, in Europe, in America, places I would have never thought, like Michigan, Alabama, there's Armenian churches out there and it's awesome, you know? But it stems from a really, really sad history of trying to be straight up wiped off this planet. And had my grandpa not, great grandpa not survived that, I wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't. Had he not gone the extra mile, killed a soldier, stole the uniform, made it out of that lake, Paul is not here. And that's scary, that's wild. One little thing would have changed my entire existence, the existence of my family, the heritage. So I am super passionate about that. I think my, my upbringing or maybe my lineage or whatever has gone through a lot 
to have me be here, especially to be in America in a, in a different climate, in a different opportunity. I was born in America. The struggles that my ancestors and my parents had to face in order to get me here to provide this life for me is gnarly. And I can't just look past that, you know, and I can't also fail my lineage or, or the people before me who sacrificed their lives or made some bold ass moves that I can't say I would make. If I saw my parents get killed in front of me, I don't know if I'd have it in me to kill a soldier and then survive. Like that's pretty gnarly or like all my friends or my family or whatever the case was being just slaughtered around me, I'd be over it, you know? So that perseverance and that will to survive has, is just inspirational to me. And I'm passionate about the Armenian genocide because not acknowledging it is only promoting further genocides that literally continue to happy, happen today. There's a genocide right now in the New Guinea area where all these tribes people from New Guinea, Papua are being ap slaughtered by like uh, some Asian government force. I don't remember which, I don't wanna misspeak and say it's like the wrong one, but there's an Asian government force right now going into New Guinea, Papua and slaughtering these tribal people. And it's, <laughs> nobody is talking about it. Sure, it's very far away from America, but those are still human beings. Mm -hmm. Those are still people that are being murdered. My feelings of war are the same thing, unnecessary. I don't think people dying is necessary. I think we can reach conclusions or agreements without that. Without A, ruining the earth, bombing each other, putting chemicals into the air, and C, killing, B, C, whatever, whatever point I'm on, killing people. I think people gotta stop killing people. Paul, what's next for you? Next for me, I'm go I leave for tour on Saturday. We're gonna pack the van with a bunch of equipment and a couple human skulls, and we're going across the country. Going to New York, then we're going to uh, Boston, then we're going to Virginia, Nashville, Houston, Dallas, Austin, then we come back, and we're gonna play some shows in California. And I'm going to make sure to play a show out here, right. out here in the OC. All right, Paul. Cheers, Thank buddy. you for being on the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show. Blaring Out with Eric Blair show with Paul Abrahamian signing off. The Blaring Out show.